and so that takes that shows us um, where water with dissolved nutrients or ions or um, can travel through that apparent free space oh, basically along the same path that we talked about as the apoplastic route um, now w an interesting um, observation about the apparent free space is that there are some characteristics of the apparent free space that become apparent um, basically when we submerge roots in uh, aqueous solutions so for example um, at some point that apoplastic route or that apparent uh, uh, nutrients moving in the apparent free space are blocked by uh, what we talked about before the Casparian strip the su suberin strip that um, penetrates the cell wall and attaches to the cell membrane of these endodermis cells forcing the nutrients across a, s a plasma membrane so transport across a membrane is going to be um, a topic here that we'll discuss but that that has to happen at that point if it hasn't happened earlier along any part of that apoplastic route um, so when we look at that apparent free space in solution um, experiments have shown where we have like a beaker of water and we have this root this plant with its roots um, down in this solution that contains a 0.2 molar solution of calcium uh, ends up taking up uh, calcium very quickly at a, at a high rate initially and then it kind of tapers off <coughs> and um, so at some point it, it starts to taper off as uptake across the cell membrane now through transport um, is uh, sort of limiting the flow of calcium into that apparent free space well, um, so there, then an equilibrium basically can develop in the apparent free space. If we transfer that um, same root system into another beaker here, <coughs> we'll draw the same uh, root here, the same root system. And in this case, the beaker of water contains pure water. Um, then some, some of that calcium uh, leaves the root system and enters the the uh, surrounding soil. The, sorry, the surrounding solution. So some of the calcium leaves the root and and enters the surrounding solution um, more so at a more rapid rate than we saw here, where equilibrium was being reached. Um, and then if we take that same root, uh, at some point the level of calcium entering the so solution drops off or um, reaches another so level of equilibrium. And then we transfer that plant to a third beaker here. And in this case, the root system is uh, immersed in a, in a beaker that contains 0.2 molars of a magnesium solution. And then we see a, a, a rise again in the amount of calcium entering that solution. So um, basically at each stage we see calcium um, uptake versus release back into the solution reaching an equilibrium but it, once we uh, immerse the root into the magnesium solution we have even more calcium that comes out of solution than did when it was in the uh, pure beaker of water the, the beaker of pure water and so that suggests that there is some kind of ion exchange happening within the apparent free space that is synonymous or similar to what happens between um, colloids and the soil solution where cations are being exchanged for one another uh, depending on the concentration of the ions in the surrounding solution um, and most likely associated with a, a binding affinity series so the so in essence the apparent free space is very synonymous uh, or similar to colloids in that they have negatively charged surfaces or the apparent free space being no, sort of surrounded by negative charges that attracts those positively charged cations. <coughs> Alright, so as we said then at some point the nutrients moving through the apparent free space are going to enter the um, cell either in the cortex or being forced through by the Casparian strip into the endodermis but at some point along that path nutrients have to cross a cell membrane to enter the cell and then they can move symplastically 
uh, towards the, the vascular cylinder. So the, so, that, so the point where we are at this, um, at this time is then to look at how nutrients are taken up by those cells, either again in the, um, directly by the epidermis or within the cortex or ultimately through the uh, endodermis cells. Where they, um, which is going to involve transport proteins. All right, so we're going to go to this um, <coughs> to the next um, slide here, which essentially is asking um, uh, once uh, nutrients reach. Um, the plasma membrane, whether we're talking about epidermis, cortex, or endodermis, how are they transported across the membrane? Okay, so that's kind of the topic of what we're looking at next. Um, different kinds of transport proteins, basically. Whoops. So these are transport proteins that we can see here. And uh, these are involved in types of transport that we've talked about before, that you've talked about in other courses before. Um, transport proteins can be involved in facilitated diffusion. Which is, which is driven by what? Basically, facilitated, diffus facilitated diffusion is a type of passive transport, which means that it doesn't require um, energy produced by the cell. And so the types of transport proteins that we see with facilitated diffusion are channel proteins, as well as uh, carrier proteins, which we can see down in the bottom panel, ch channel proteins in the upper panel. Now, what is it that drives facilitated diffusion? Uh, if you recall, it is a concentration gradient, or we could also call, refer to this as a chemical potential gradient in the ion itself. We've talked about chemical potential of water, but any, <clears throat> any molecule or ion um, has its own chemical potential depending on the, the concentration of the, of the ion or the molecule. <clears throat> now when we're talking about, um, so, so you can see from the diagram here that that same idea where there's a higher concentration of, um, say, some kind of solute on this side of the membrane, and, and it's moving in the direction of where the concentration is lower through a channel protein. Likewise, in the carrier protein below, we see um, a higher concentration on one side of the membrane, which is the extracellular side of the membrane, and compared to the uh, cytoplasmic side of the membrane. And so, in this case, the ions are binding to a specific site within a specific carrier protein. And when b that binding takes place, then there's a conformational change that allows the um, protein to change shape and then releases the ion or solute to the other side of the membrane. And then once the solute um, is dissociates from the binding site, then the transport protein goes back to its original conformation, which is open to the uh, extracellular side of the membrane. So that's just basically how channel uh, proteins versus carrier proteins work. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a couple more details about the channel proteins. The interior channel um, is hydrophilic. And so that's what allows these hydrophilic substances through. The hydrophilic um, ions or solutes are surrounded by a uh, hydration shell. And so it's really the size of the ion plus the hydration shell plus the actual charge, the, the strength of the charge of the ion that is important to a specific channel protein here. Um, 
Now, channeled proteins are a lot more efficient in um, in transporting uh, ions across. So we have something on the order of a hundred um, million ions that are that can be transported um, per second across a cell membrane, which means that there are fewer and this is in comparison to carrier proteins which uh, transport something on the order of 10,000 to 100,000 uh, ions per second. Okay, so they're sort of, they're more limited in their rates um, because of the idea that ch carrier proteins are, are specific to certain solutes, that there is a binding process that takes place, um, that there are only a certain number of binding sites available um, and that there, that conformation will change takes time. So there's a slower process of transport with carrier proteins. Channel proteins, as long as the, the hydrated ion can pass through the, the hydrophilic channel, then several can pass through in any given period of time. So there, it requires fewer, cells require fewer channel proteins to be um, synthesized compared to the number of carrier proteins. So, carry, so uh, carry proteins, even though channel proteins have some specificity to certain ions, there uh, is a, a higher degree of specificity between carrier proteins and the solutes that they transport. All right, and so just to add, since we were talking about the difference in how they function, the conformational change um, results from uh, binding the solute to, which is like a substrate, to a binding site. <clears throat> and that's what transports the ion across the membrane. All right, so keep in mind those, those various factors that we talked about l limits the rate of um, carrier transport. All right, uh, let's see. So both of these are uh, indeed important for facilitated transport um, down a concentration gradient. When we are talking about ions, another aspect of passive uh, transport that we can discuss uh, in terms of a gradient is a gradient in the, electro the, um, the electrochemical uh, aspects of ions. So the electrical gradient is, is going to have to do with the amount of charge on either side of the membrane as well as the concentration gradient which refers to the chemical. So electro refers to the charge differential across the membrane and this refers to the concentration gradient across the membrane. Alright, now um, concentration gradients and electrochemical gradients are not always favorable for the transport of um, solutes or ions or molecules um, and so uh, so that's where we get into the discussion of different types of active transport which is what we're going to mainly focus on in the next uh, video clip but just to introduce it one uh, type of active transport that everybody is mostly familiar with is where ATP is used to phosphorylate uh, a carrier protein. ATP phosphorylating molecules is a, is a typical um, discussion about active um, anything that's associated with active transport um, a carrier molecule or carrier protein. Um, and so you can see that demonstrated here in this diagram where a carrier protein is um, being uh, phosphorylated to carry uh, a, a single solute in this scene across the um, membrane into the extracellular side. But we're going to focus on another type that involves a hydrogen ion pump to set up that or to drive that electrochemical gradient um, in order to um, facilitate or in order to um, actively or drive active transport 
for both channel and carrier proteins in another way, not directly by ATP phosphorylation of those transport and carrier proteins, but by ATP phosphorylation of a hydrogen ion pump. So that's what we'll be focusing on in the next video clip.